Hello and welcome to the Better Man Clinics, the podcast where we talk to actual experts to address the questions that men want answered, but are either too embarrassed to ask or simply don't know who to ask. Before we get started, I do want to caution that the conversations on this podcast are for informational purposes only. They don't represent a medical consultation, nor do they present medical advice to individuals. Rather, we hope that the podcast empowers men with the knowledge and confidence to address these issues with their healthcare providers. As with any medical or wellness issues, you should always consult with your healthcare provider before beginning any type of treatment or preventative intervention. Now, with that being said, in this episode, we discuss the impact of the mind on how we perceive and manage chronic pain. Now, we've all heard the concept of mind over matter and the importance of having the right mindset to overcome adversity and to succeed. But can your state of mind impact how you actually experience pain? And to that extent, can psychotherapy teach your mind to process chronic pain differently so as to make it less debilitating? Now, in asking these questions, we are in no way implying that pain is quote unquote all in your head. Rather, we're exploring if and how the mind can be trained to perceive and process pain signals from the rest of the body in a way that makes living with chronic pain more manageable. Now, to answer these questions, we spoke to a researcher who has been studying this fascinating topic and whose recently published groundbreaking study has yielded some pretty dramatic results. Dr. Tor Wager is the Diana L. Taylor Distinguished Professor in Neuroscience at Dartmouth College. He received his PhD from the University of Michigan in Cognitive Psychology in 2003 and served as an assistant and associate professor at Columbia University, and then as an associate and full professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Since 2004, he has directed the Cognitive and Effective Neuroscience Laboratory, a research lab devoted to work on the neurophysiology of effective processes like pain, emotion, stress, and empathy, and how they are shaped by cognitive and social influences. And now, I bring you our conversation with Dr. Tor Wager about how we can leverage our minds to help overcome chronic pain. Hello, and welcome to Better Man Clinics. Today, we're going to be talking about the impact of the mind and specifically the mindset on chronic pain. Now, you know, we've all heard the expression mind over matter. We've heard about concepts like the growth mindset and the success mindset. But to what extent does that really impact people with pain? Now, if you talk to a lot of people with chronic pain, they'd probably tell you, well, not much, right? How can can my mind impact the pain I'm experiencing in a completely different part of my body? But recent uh, pretty groundbreaking research might actually show that the mind has a much greater impact on our experience of pain than than we would have otherwise imagined. Now, to help us better understand this, we are really uh, proud and honored to have join us uh, Dr. Tor Wager, who is a professor of neuroscience at Dartmouth College and actually has been conducting some of this exciting research. Dr. Wager, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks, Oleg. It's really nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Before we dive into the into the subject at hand, you know, I, I always like to kind of get to know our, our, our expert a little bit better. And uh, particularly, obviously, you're, you're studying a really interesting uh, concept and a really interesting uh, part of the body for sure. What got you first excited about uh, neuroscience, about the, the study of the mind, and particularly the areas that you're exploring today? Yeah, thanks. I think this it kind of goes way back to me. Honestly, my first time that I really knew that I was interested in neuroscience was when I was in fourth grade. I remember mm-hmm. a couple of things. I remember being in a class and, and holding a cat brain yeah. and then hearing about a guy who had a bombshell lodged next to his hypothalamus. Mm-hmm. And he turned his head one way he laughed and the other way he cried. <laughs> you know, like, how can this, how can this be? Right. And then I remember perusing uh, Richard Restack's book around 1980 called The Mind. And it had some of the first images of, of PET scans and probably SPECT scans in them. And as a, you know, an elementary school student at the time, I'm like, oh, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it's just wild. Anyway, there's a longer story between then and, and now, but, um, I, you know, I, I think I had a longstanding interest and I, 
wandered all over the place in my education. So I, I studied um, physics and philosophy first, and then I ended up being a music major in college. And wow. only after that, figuring out that this is what I want to do. I want to do scholarship and research, and, and I want to come back to the brain. Um, and so then I sort of found my way back. <laughs> What a crazy path, right? That's that's amazing. But I mean, I, I find that people who find that kind of path are, are oftentimes the most passionate, right? Because it's, it wasn't like that kind of cookie cutter. It goes A to B to C. Like you really found your way to your passion. And that kind of, I, I see that in you. And I, I see a lot of people who kind of had that type of path for sure. Yeah, there's this this kernel of motivation um, that about, you know, certain questions I want to answer or just be part of answering. And, and so I try to hang on to that and really kind of keep pursuing those fundamental questions uh, in whatever way I can and kind of chipping away, right? And true, true you know, knowledge and insight is really hard to come by. Um, yeah, for, for but, sure. Uh, well, we're definitely going to start chipping away here because I definitely have some questions and, and I, I know the guys do too, because this is a really fascinating topic. Uh, you know, before we do, I, I want to actually kind of level set a little bit. So we're going to, I know we're going to be talking a lot about mindset and to, to different people, that means different things to a professional like yourself who studies this. How would you define mindset? Mindset is the lens through which you view events that are happening to you in, in your body, in your world, things coming through the senses. So it's, I, I think of it as a set of predispositions, what, how we're prepared to interpret and respond to events. Got it. Got it. Well, that certainly makes sense in terms of like, you know, how you can um, react to a life changing event, right? Like, uh, you know, a loss of a job or, or a natural disaster, what people find trouble connecting the dots, right? And maybe this we can dive right into that is, if I'm feeling pain somewhere, particularly chronic pain, I could have the best mindset, but won't I still be feeling that pain? How does mindset impact your experience with pain? So first of all, I think we have to acknowledge a couple of things. Um, I think mindset here goes deeper than sort of trying to put a good face on pain or adopt a positive attitude towards it. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that can be helpful, but that can also be exactly the, the wrong approach. Sometimes people start off saying, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm, I'm really tough, I'm resilient, I'm just gonna push through this. I'm gonna go, you know, right. go on. And, and it, it doesn't work for many people. So it's, it's not just that, you know, being optimistic is, is the answer, right? I think of the, the definition I just gave you of mindset, it's, it's about how you're prepared to respond to events. And that means that when you have, you know, sensations that say that are coming from your body, what do they mean to you? You know, deep down in your heart, what, what do you, what, you know, what do you believe? What does your brain believe this, this means? Um, mm -hmm. And it could mean a lot of different things, right? Those sensations could be normal. They could be temporary. They could be a sign of, of an, you know, an injury that's going to, to go away soon. And you, you know, you can put it in a little box and get a handle on it and say, yep, that's, that's going to go on for a little while. It'll get, it'll get better. Or it can be sort of fundamentally something that's really scary and really threatening. Right. And I, I think that chronic pain is often characterized by that latter kind of interpretation. So, you know, so whatever you tell yourself, um, we have a, a set, we, we, we have a, a kind of an underlying mindset that comes from our experience and our background about, about what this, you know, what the sensations I'm feeling uh, mean for me. And I think that's really a, a key. So is the challenge then for people with chronic pain, you know, again, you talked about the different buckets about, is this going to be short term or is this something like, you know, a big problem? You said that for chronic pain, most people put it in that latter bucket, right? This is a serious big problem. Is it, is it, is the, the goal to get them out of that bucket of, of mindset, like to put it into a different perspective? Yeah, where I hope we'll get to during this conversation is about how to change the way we think about pain and what the mindset is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are some particular ways of doing that that we found are, are really helpful and that I really believe in. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it's also worth saying kind of at the outset of this conversation that, um, that we've changed our views about what pain is quite a lot through uh, the, the last decade or so of neuroscience and, and neuroimaging of pain. And you really, you, 
you know, the textbooks would all say that this is something that happens to you. There's all this detail about the receptors in the body and the nerve endings, wonderful you know, physiological detail. And then there's this transduction up into the spinal cord, which is a, a relay station. And, and then poof, the brain, it gets to the brain and poof, there's the pain. It, you know? yeah. <laughs> um, That's how I've learned about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it's just that that brain part is so complex, you know, and so, so active. And so there's so much happening there that it's been hard to unpack it. And we're just kind of at the very tip of the iceberg in terms of, of unpacking what, what actually happens. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we know now is that pain, like any sensation from your body, is uh, not sort of a, a, a veridical picture of, of what's happening in your body. It's, it's a construction. And it's a construction that your brain makes largely unconsciously. So it's sort of not about how, you know, you as a person consciously interpret pain. That's, that's only a small part of the story. It's about, it's about what, how, you know, how your brain interprets uh, pain. And so instead of thinking of it as a sensation that sort of relayed up and then poof, there, there it is. Um, I've, and, and others too, have come to think about pain as it's a decision that's made in the brain about how, what what it should be feeling and what you how you should respond so if if a sensation is an indicator of uh, future tissue damage looking out into the future this is going to be harmful this is going to be um, a, a problem for my body this means that my body's been in, invaded or compromised that's when your brain decides that pain is the appropriate response Got it. Um, and other sensations are not interpreted as as pain um, so it's this complex decision, and it's not only based on the signals coming up from the body through the spinal cord. It's also based on the context, uh, your, your prior beliefs and memories and knowledge and, and, uh, uh, and projections into the, the future about, about what's, uh, what's, what's expected and, and, and how to interpret these signals. Um, so there's a lot more to unpack there, but that's kind of the direction that... No, but, but that's actually a really interesting presentation of it because again to your point when I was in medical school uh the the thought is okay just like you said receptor spinal cord there's a part of your brain that that gets that pain and sends a signal and that's where the pain is but the way you're describing it is that's only one part of the picture and the brain actually is actually integrating multiple inputs some of which are not just sensory you're not just feeling it it's your memory it's your it's it's your life experiences is how you how you interact so there's multiple parts of the brain kind of integrating all that information and then spitting out your response to it. Is, is that a fair, a fair description? Yep, absolutely. And, uh, and, and I could sort of, you know, say a couple other things that might be helpful to sort of set the context. Um, one of them is um, people subject themselves to physical, you know, unpleasant physical sensations all the time. You know, you, people climb, K2, they climb mountains, they get frostbite, they're, you know, and they oh. think this is great. This is really fun. Maybe not every moment, right? But, <laughs> you know, and so what's the difference be between being really cold or, or feeling muscle pain because you're working out and you're getting a great workout versus, you know, torture, right? And I think right. the same thing, the same ex ex sensations would be torture if you weren't in control of them, choosing them, knowing when they're going to end and what they're for. And Such a that good interpretation, point. right, is is really all, all of the difference. Uh, and with chronic pain, it, you know, these sensations are often unexplained, uh, frightening. I mean, it's naturally frightening, right? Pain is a scary mm -hmm. thing. It means something's wrong with your body. But then that belief that something's wrong with your body, sometimes that becomes that feeds into the fear, and that that perpetuates the pain. Um, kind of like a vicious cycle there basically uh of that but if that that's such a good point i mean with the workout i mean if you see my workouts i i would do some would think i was being tortured but uh the but I, I i keep coming back for more because it does make you feel good uh you know about yourself even though again the, some would say that it could have been uh, it could have been a form of torture uh but th that, that's right. that's, that's a very good yeah. point I, I never thought about it that way now you had mentioned uh um a minute ago in terms of influencing that mindset can people volitionally consciously make changes so that they perceive though that chronic pain differently so, so 
we, we can do that. And there's sort of two levels. One is that we, we have the power to change how we think about every sensation or stimulus or situation. We have some power, right? Um, so in my lab, we've studied um, reappraisal or the cognitive regulation of pain and emotion by asking people to focus um, on specific aspects and, and even create, using their imagination, create certain aspects. Um, so for example, if you're looking at a, a picture of a, you know, a, a child who's you know, starving and they have the distended stomach or something like that and they're crying, you, you know, you can think about this as like, oh my, this is really so terrible, right? How, how horrible is this? And you can go, you know, elaborate on that, follow that with your mind. And we can, we ask people to reappraise and say, well, imagine that this is, um, you know, this, this person's actually fine. Like they're, they're crying for some other reason. They're not really suffering. Um, you know, it's maybe even, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not real, right? This is a movie, this is fake. I mean, people have a lot of ways that they can change the interpretation of those, those sensations. Um, what my, I think my, one of my favorites is one of the central practices of um, mindfulness-based therapies, including ACT or acceptance and commitment therapy and, and others, which is to, uh, um, sit with the sensation, experience sensation, so the sensation or, or, or whatever, you know, if it's in your body or if it's something that you're seeing or experiencing and don't try to avoid it, don't look away, um, experience that for what it is and realize that that's just a sensation, that's an experience. You know, it's time limited, it will, it will go away. And sometimes, and that's, you know, the practice of acceptance, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes that's, really helpful um, because sometimes you know imagine that um, you know you're experiencing pain and that that pain is is naturally scary and you you want to ignore it so you want to look away or, or like you know attend elsewhere you go on with your life press on be the be a you know th that super person that you are um, and but you can't because it hurts <laughs> right so and then, and then you've just failed, right? So you're saying, I'm going to ignore this pain, but you can't ignore it because it's the most, it's the most salient thing that's happening to you. And so mm -hmm. then you failed to ignore it. And then that's even more scary, right? right. <laughs> and so exactly. that, and it breaks through, right? So, so pain often commands attention. So the bottom line is, you know, often it's like, don't, don't try to just, just ignore it, um, but actually attend to it, accept it for what it is as a sensation. And try to work with that that sensation. So that's part of what has worked really well in our studies. Um, can I? But let me switch gears for a second. So sure. what I was just talking about is people's ability to cognitively regulate by bringing in their imaginations and and voluntarily sort of reframing things. Right? Mm -hmm. Accept it. You know, see it. Yeah. You know, don't react to it. Just accept it as a sensation and so forth. Um, and that's part of the story. And I, I think that the other part of the story is about getting the right information about <clears throat> what's driving the pain or what's causing it so that it fundamentally isn't as scary as it was. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, you know, um, it, if, if you're experiencing um, chronic pain and you have little control over it and it's really, really bad, you know, of course it's, it's frightening, right? And it's, it's especially frightening if that pain is a signal of tissue damage. So, and that, that's the belief, right? That this pain is an indicator that, uh, let's say it's my back, my back is damaged, it's injured. Right. And therefore every time it hurts, that means my back is being injured more and that's going to make it worse. And therefore I'm going to be in pain a long time. Mm -hmm. That, that belief is often, reinforced by uh, physicians and caregivers. You know, somebody's neurosurgeon might tell them, yep, you're always gonna be in pain. And then they go see a pain psychologist and the pain psychologist says, yeah, we don't really know what's causing it. You're always gonna be in pain. And that's fundamentally scary, right? So, so I mean, how do you rethink that fear of something that's fundamentally terrifying? It's yeah, that's my question to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> if, so, so the, the, tri the, the, the trick or the, the idea is that is is to realize that often 
when pain is, has become chronic, the original injury has actually healed. And the, the signs of, you know, that look like pathology in the back or the neck or whatever, they're actually not driving the pain. And what's driving the pain is instead this sensitization process uh, in, in, in neural circuitry. So pain induces fear and fear induces hypervigilance and attention, which increases the pain. And it, almost like your brain is learning to just ramp it up. Mm -hmm. And so various neural pathways are, are sensitizing. Right. And, and it's, it's realizing that then you can say, well, actually it isn't a sign of tissue damage. It's not fundamentally scary. It's just pain. Mm -hmm. And so that, I think, you know, to, to realize that truth, um, that can be a key to people really uh, changing their, their beliefs and changing their fear. You see what I mean? So you're not trying to sort of convince yourself that something, you know, like this, I'm terrified, but this isn't really scary. Rethink it, rethink it, right? Right. Don't right. do that. But instead, you, you, have to, you have to sort of come, come to actually realize and, and really believe that, that, that the pain is, you know, created and maintained by these fear circuits, essentially. In well, I, I think that's that's an important point. I mean, so obviously, first of all, like when somebody says mind over matter, they, the first instinct is, yeah, 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 I'll just pretend it doesn't exist. It doesn't it doesn't exist. I'm, I'm stronger than this. I don't have to feel it, which I agree in my experience uh, in talking to patients and others that that doesn't seem to work uh, versus, again, where you're saying acceptance. Well, that, that's an important part, right? Because that, that's step one. And then you're you're basically, if I understand you correctly, saying, OK, listen, there's pain. I'm acknowledging the pain, but the pain is not necessarily something that's horrible it's it's a sensation but it's not a sign of something bad and it's not necessarily going to get worse and you kind of come to grips with it my question for you though is that is that a one-time phenomenon or is that something like every time you get pain you have to have that conversation with yourself and over time it just kind of adjusts how would you describe that right it's a practice mm -hmm. it is you know the pain itself can become a reminder that, um, you know, of, of the belief that this is, this, this is, it is just pain. It's not damaging. And if pain is not damaging, then it's not going to hurt me. It's not fundamentally scary. And now I can start practicing attending to the pain and experiencing it as a sensation. I can practice that acceptance, experience it as a sensation um, because it's actually safe. It's like, wow, what is that crazy sensation I'm feeling? That's my brain basically, you know, sensitizing or tricking, tricking itself into, into feeling this thing. And, um, and that helps ramp it down over time. So it may not go away all at once. Right? But it but it it can unwind that spiral of of pain, fear, more pain, more fear. You know that sensitization. Yeah, I mean, and that's something that also I mean that really resonates when you said that because also if you I know you know a lot of people who suffer from chronic pain and one of their biggest problems is not even the only the pain but the despondency that goes with it, right? The fact that like you know what this is just never going to get better and my life is going to be ruined by this pain and it just creates this vicious cycle for sure. I can definitely see that in in personal experience uh, for sure. Now, but the question I have for you is. Is there a sliding scale? Is there like, um, have you found that, you know, for mild pain, this works really well, but if people have like really bad chronic pain, it may not work as well. Is there like, is there a sliding scale where the perception, I guess the sensation overcomes the integration in your brain of how you perceive it? Yeah, that's a great question. We, we have not found that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I mean, it's a kind of an open, question right so if, if you're in excruciating pain you can't think about any anything else i mean it might be very difficult right and sure. I, you know it's really a tough but right I, I think it may not be so much about the intensity of pain as it is about what's driving the pain so mm -hmm. if if pain is driven let's say you have a sciatica it's really a a, a pinched nerve and you're getting constant no susceptive input, it, which is pain driving, you know, up the spinal cord and the in, in, in your brain is doing what it's supposed to do, which is register this as pain, sure. right? Um, so, so if that's the case, then, um, then 
the pain probably isn't going to go away. I mean, you actually can habituate to it. The brain might actually learn that, hey, this sensation is, is actually in the normal range, right? It doesn't, if, if the brain learns that it doesn't mean tissue damage, you won't experience as pain. <laughs> I think that's a key. But let's right. say, you know, it's a persistent drive. It's going to be, it's going to be there, you know, plus or minus until, you know, the, the, the cause in the body goes away. And so that's, that's one part of it. But that's not the only part. And it's not all or none, right? It's not either in your body or sort of quote in your head. It's, it's that you have some component of this pain that's persistent, no susceptive drive. And then this other part, which is your brain sensitizing. So your spinal cord even start, can start responding more intensely to the same input. Mm -hmm. um, and the centers in your brain, like the amygdala, for example, which is a center for, that's important for pain and also for fear, you know, it, it starts responding to normal, like normally non-sensory input, uh, non-painful input as though it's, it's really pain. So it's, you know, it's driving the alarm, right? So that's this, that's this other part. So you can have real injury, real causes of pain in the body, but you can also have this sensitization on top of it. Um, and that sensitization is what you can unwind over time by, by realizing that connection and realizing that it is sensitization. It's not, it's not injury. Got it. And so is that, is the amygdala considered like that part of the brain that kind of spins this cycle generally, that, that, that vicious cycle? Well, there, there, there are, there are lots of parts of this brain working together <laughs> and that's, mm -hmm. that's one of the candidates, but you know, so if you think about it the, the following way, I can, I can give you a little more of a breakdown. Um, yep. So, um, one part is the spinal cord itself. So you have these neurons, which are plus or minus pretty selective for, for painful events in the spinal cord. Those neurons can become more sensitive. Where do they send input to? Well, they send input partly to the thalamus, which is thought of as a relay station, but really these are all sort of like processing hubs, right? They're deep neural networks in themselves, so to speak. Yeah. That, that then um, communicate with the rest of the, the cortex. So, so the, the nociceptive neurons in your thalamus can sensitize and they can start responding to multiple parts of your body. Um, it also sends, you know, inputs also comes up to the amygdala, which is um, probably really important for creating a, 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 a aspects of the fear and avoidance response. Um, it might also be important for, for linking other things like cues in your environment to pain so that then environmental cues can start triggering that but both potentially pain and, and fear um, and then there's other parts of your brain which um, are not about necessarily the immediate pain experience itself but about the avoidance and suffering that you attach to it what it what the signals mean for you mm -hmm. so for example you know, I can, I don't know, I can pinch my arm and I can go like, that doesn't do much. Or I can, you know, you can pinch my arm in a way that I can't control. And I go, ah, I, I, I got to get away. And furthermore, yeah. I'm never going to let you get near me again. <laughs> right. right. That's right. avoidance. Right. And so For the sure. same sensation can lead to a big avoidance response, you know, and, and a lot of the sort of fear and suffering, I think, goes along with the avoidance. So those are other systems in the brain, in the, the medial prefrontal cortex, you know, communicating with uh, your nucleus accumbens and your amygdala. And let's say that, you know, the medial prefrontal cortex is helping construct this future looking thing that like, hey, when, you know, uh, <laughs> when, when uh, you know, Dr. Schwartz is, is here, I, I better, uh, you know, I, that's, that's really scary. I better get away. I better avoid even going to the locations where, you know, yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> uh, and so then that sort of instruction amygdala to, to sort of respond with a threat response, you know, in the wrong context. And, and then you've got this other part, which is this connection with the nucleus of commons that says, yeah, I better shape my, my sort of motivational systems to, you know, if, if I have pain in these, social situations, or if I have pain here in this context, or at these, this, court, this class, I'm going to devalue that class. I'm going to withdraw motivation from that and, you know, withdraw and pull in and, and stay home and hunker down. Like that, that's the avoidance response. Okay. So that was sort of a long way of saying, 
that's another big part of it, right? The, the avoidance and suffering. And there's, yeah. there's, you know, all these systems kind of really work together um, to, to create various facets of, you know, the, 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 the pain, suffering and avoidance. Got it. And, you know, listen, the guys listening to here probably at this point are saying, hey, this sounds pretty cool. These are some interesting theories, but, but what's the data behind it? I want to jump into your study in a few minutes, but just in terms of, I'm sure there's been some studies that kind of set the table for you to some extent historically that like kind of shared that relationship between mindset and health issues, either pain or otherwise. Can you share some of that like historical data in terms of kind of what, what maybe even led you to think about the study that you did? Absolutely. I'll share a, a couple of lines of work that I think are really compelling to me. One of them is work on placebo effects that we've been uh, doing in the lab over the past um, 15 years or so almost. <laughs> um, and the, the idea of a placebo is that it's a sham treatment. Uh, so it's basically getting nothing. But of course, yeah. it's taking the treatment, the act and the context and the setting that can uh, elicit all of these brain responses that are not about the stimulus itself, uh, that can shape how pain is perceived and how it evolves. And so, so placebo studies are a way of studying how context affects the construction of pain in the brain. And mm -hmm. one of the, some of the things that we know from the placebo work is that feeling better about a treatment, you know, confidence essentially that you're being treated can um, reduce signals in pain related centers uh, in the brain. It can wow. even reduce signals in the spinal cord that seem that, that are responses to, to pain. So potentially the information coming up to the brain itself can be turned down. Mm -hmm. um, it can release opioids, which are the, the oldest medic, you know, medicine, as far as I know, actually, you know, um, um, pharmacological agent, uh, which is, you know, um, morphine, and now fentanyl, heroin, they're all opiates or uh, opioids, and they, they, uh, your brain produces those, right, and, and your brain produces them uh, in response to uh, uh, instructions or suggestions that, that you're, you have help, you're, you're, you're being aided. You know, you have right. a treatment that's going to help you. Um, so, so the brain releases opioids, right? And, and then, okay, so that's placebo effects. And then we think, well, why, you know, why does it do that? Why would, you know, believing that you're being helped release opioids and decrease pain signaling? Um, and it's because of what I said earlier, that your brain is making this decision based on the whole context is what's appropriate to feel now. And if what's appropriate is that, you know, these pain signals are not very important and other things are more important, then ramp down the pain and ramp up those other signals. Got it, you know? got it. So if it's, yeah, pain versus the, the pursuit of food or, you know, uh, you know, uh, mates or, or whatever other motivations, right? Then, yeah. then the brain ramps it down when the pain is less important and it ramps it up when the pain is more important. No, that's actually a good point. It brings up to mind like two scenarios, two things. Well, one is that that concept of ramping up and ramping down, like, you know, you always hear about these situations where somebody can be like su substantially injured, but like in the, in the heat of the moment, they're not even feeling their pain because they're just, you know, there's your brain is prioritizing, you know, survival and you're, you're, you're not even noticing they don't, oftentimes people don't even realize how, ex how much they're hurt until that survival instinct is camp down because they're out of the path of danger. So I, I can definitely see that kind of the way you're describing it. The, the question I have for you, just, just to clarify, so is opioids, opiates, you know, the, the, the issues we're having right now, is that just basically medicinally accomplishing the same task that you're describing kind of more volitionally, like in, from a psychological perspective? Is it kind of the same idea, but there's just through a medicine perspective, and obviously has its own slippery slope of problems, uh, not justified in any way, but is it the same type of thing that the medicine versus you volitionally are doing to your brain to try to change that perspective? Exactly. One of the amazing discoveries now decades old by um, Snyder and, and Candace Pert was the idea that um, if, your brain responds to an opioid drug, 
because it has receptors for them, right? It mm -hmm. makes its own receptor. That means it makes its own endogenous chemical <laughs> that does, mm -hmm. you know, that, that binds to those receptors. So, right. um, and th that's sort of how the opioid receptors were discovered um, in, this, in the 60s. Uh, so that's kind of a wonderful fact. Well, um, you know, why does your brain produce opioids and opioid receptors? Well, I think it's to allow the brain to have context-based control over pain and emotion and motivation. So it's precisely, you know, so, so in, in animal studies, right, you can show that if an animal is, is in a situation where it has to fight another animal, right, it's either fighting or mating or, or whatever, pain signals are decreased. Right. In, you know, childbirth, a whole bunch of things happen that decrease pain signals. Well, why is that? It's because um, these are these are situations, right? These are contexts where it's not very adaptive to feel a lot of pain. And so the brain has these mechanisms for turning it down. And opioids are part of that, uh, part of that mechanism. Um, and they're not the only drugs, right? There's a bunch of other chemicals that are really important. Serotonin's important, cannabinoids are important, you know, and others as well. Um, right. so, but you're like this, right? Is is to provide this nuanced control over the over over pain. Such an interesting way to think about it. I mean, it's just really doing the same thing, but you're taking external chemicals versus trying to get your body to trigger it internally without the need for those external chemicals, basically. Yeah, that's how I think about it. And, and I think those external chemicals can have <clears throat> a couple of issues, right? One is that they're often, it's like a sledgehammer compared to a you know, jeweler's hammer or something like that, right? So they, <laughs> they hit you from the outside and they go everywhere in your brain, they're systemic, and they just mm -hmm. have a lot, lots of different effects. Um, you know, so um, they're not very well targeted to, to sort of, you know, the exact context and setting, right? Where, where your in, internal chemicals are produced in a very fine grain, very targeted way, right? In mm -hmm. smaller amounts. The other big problem of the sledgehammer of, of pharmacology is that your brain actively adapts and so with mm -hmm. opioids in particular, but with many uh, you know, chemicals, if you, if you take it from the outside, your brain is basically getting this huge influx of this chemical and it says, wow, I got a lot more than I expected, right? This is an anomaly. I better desensitize. I better downregulate opioid receptors. I better make them less sensitive. Mm. So over time, what happens the first time you take a, a, an opioid drug, the first time you take whatever, fentanyl, which I haven't, but you know, you you might get this huge high, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, it's amazing, it's unexpected. But then you started the process of desensitizing that system that makes you feel so good. And so mm -hmm. now, you afterward, you end up with a low. You feel kind of like crap. And you take it again, and the high is shorter, and the low is longer and deeper. And the high is shorter and shorter and shorter until after you've taken opioids you know, for a while, for maybe a couple months even, the, the high is very little. It makes you feel normal. And in right. between, when you're not on it, you feel horrible. <laughs> Got it. Because, because, because you now you're completely dependent on that system, right? So, yeah. so I think that's a real, that's a principle. It's called opponent process um, theory, you know, mm -hmm. which is that, that your brain is essentially adapting and you have this, this positive high process and then the, the antagonist opponent process that, 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 um, that grows you know, stronger over time because your brain is adapting to that. Uh, it, makes, it makes a lot of sense. That's for sure. Now, you put all these theories to the test recently in this, uh, this pretty cool study that I'd love to hear about where you basically, uh, and I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but you basically saw if you could uh, treat chronic pain through psychological therapy, I'm assuming uh, utilizing a lot of these concepts and approaches that we talked about, you know, from a, from a perspective of, of training your mind to think in the right mindset and came up with some pretty amazing results. Can you share that with us? And just basically the, the context and what went into it and kind of what came out of it. I'd love to hear more. Absolutely. Yeah. This is a, a study that um, we ran in, in Boulder over the past few years, Boulder, Colorado, where I, I was before I moved to Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. And um, we studied three groups. One is, and these are people with chronic back pain, and they've been in pain an average of about 10 years prior to coming into the study. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they were in, you know, my, I, would say, I would say moderate levels of pain, which is fairly typical for chronic low back pain. 
it, mm -hmm. we, you have to have a four out of 10 pain to get into the study. <laughs> um, okay, that's reasonable. And so that's, you know, they're, they're able to do things and move about, but it's real pain. And we actually have interviews from um, most of the, uh, the patients in the study in our treatment group agreed to give interviews. And you can see how they talk about their pain and how much it affected their life. And that's what really hits home more than, than the numbers. Um, so, so they had, you know, clinical pain that really was disabling for them. And they, um, they were with, split into three groups, randomized into three groups. Um, one is this treatment as usual group where uh, they, we followed them for a month and, and they didn't uh, change their treatments. We actually followed everybody out to a year after that, but the major pre post a month treatment. The second group was a placebo group that got an injection of uh, a placebo into their backs, which is a mimicking epidural steroid injection. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we chose that because epidural steroid injections are very, very commonly used uh, for, for chronic low back pain, but they don't beat placebo in clinical trials on average. Really? So and they're really still using yeah, the whole treatment may, may be just a placebo, even though they're done, you know, thousands are done every day. Um, I had no idea. The, That's incredible. Yeah. The third group was, was, uh, was called, a, it was a, a treatment called pain reprocessing therapy. Mm -hmm. And it essentially encapsulates some of the principles that I was telling you about earlier a, a few minutes ago. Um, and it involved uh, four weeks of treatment twice a week with a therapist. And the therapist, it, it turns out, so <laughs> I, can, I can tell you a little bit more of the, the context of the study too, because um, we didn't develop this treatment. This treatment was developed by um, a, ther a pain therapist named Alan Gordon in LA. He runs a pain psychology center there. And he's a former chronic pain sufferer of multiple types. And he found his way out essentially, you know, th through these, uh, these principles. And so now he helps other people. Um, along with another uh, sort of co-inventor of this is Howard Schubiner, who's um, an MD who's been treating pain of various types um, and, and other kinds of somatic symptoms, unexplained symptoms for, for over 20 years um, successfully. So, um, Howard and Alan had been, you know, doing these things and we were studying brains. And over the past years before this, you know, I, I saw Howard at a conference or two and he said, we're helping people, you gotta study this. <laughs> I said, oh, well, we're not doing, you know, chronic pain studies right now, we're doing a lot of other stuff. So, you know, maybe later. And they, they got in touch again um, to help interpret the brain scan of a patient who had a remarkable recovery and had been, you know, covered television and, and all that stuff. And he said, can you help us kind of interpret this and, and know what to do with it, or write it up or something? And I said, well, you can't, you know, you can't really do this from one person. We, re we really need a group of people. And right. we were starting a chronic back pain study at that time. Um, and so he said, yeah, let's, you know, let's add this, right? Can we, you know, pull together some money from different sources and, and then ended up, you know, from my, a lot more money from my, my grants. And, and we cobbled this together and added the, this uh, treatment group, you know, what they, what they were doing. So that's our third arm. Um, so it, it was, you know, clinically working for people, but had never been studied. Um, um, and I can tell you more in a second, if you wanted to know about, about how it sort of compares to other treatments and, and we can unpack it. But the basic thing that happened was we followed people pre post a month with uh, brain imaging and clinical outcomes and then out to a year. Uh, and what happened was um, that, uh, the, you know, the, the usual care group improved very little. There's a very minor improvement, which is expected, yeah. people kind of get, get be a little bit better over time. Um, mm -hmm. um, there was a, uh, there was a small but significant placebo effect. So getting that sham injection actually had a benefit <laughs> a month later on clinical pain, which yeah. is surprising. Um, but, the, but the news here from this paper was really this uh, pain reprocessing therapy group, PRT group. Um, two thirds of the sample was pain-free or nearly pain-free at the end of the study, um, at, at the end of the month, and they stayed better for uh, a year, at least as, as long as we followed them out. Um, that is not typical. It's not typical. So, so the, the effect size, you know, you can compare to 
meta-analyses, which are summaries of many studies who, that do cognitive behavioral therapy, um, yoga, mindfulness, um, NSAIDs, you know, like ibuprofen, um, things like that, and um, opioids. And the effect sizes for most of these treatments are around 0.5. Uh, which is sort of modest effect. Our, our effect sizes are three times as large. So it was really dramatic. Like every, every person showed improvement and most people showed the really you know, substantial improvement. Um, when we talked to people afterwards, people said, you know, this was, this changed my life. Um, yeah, uh, I, I can imagine. Now the, this pain reprocessing therapy, I mean, you, you said they went, they uh, underwent that for four weeks and, but you followed them out for a year. So they never had to have any subsequent therapy after that, like or, um, the, the pain reprocessing therapy or that was it basically. Right. That was, it was, it was eight sessions. That was the treatment. And after that, they're on their own, you know, but, but the, hopefully at this, the, the idea of the sessions is um, to, to, understand some of the principles that we've been talking about. The, the central one is that um, once pain has become chronic, even if you have a really terrible looking back uh, and you have you know bulges and discs, well, guess what? Everybody does. Almost everybody at my age even, or you know, most people at my age have some sort of spinal you know, abnormality. That's most often not the cause of pain. Um, so those spinal MRI findings are not diagnostic. And in fact, you know, even if you had a real injury, and some people in our study did, almost everyone that we had spinal images on, you know, that we, that were available, um, had abnormalities. Um, um, so they had, you know, typical bad-looking spines. Um, but um, that that probably wasn't the cause of their ongoing chronic pain. <laughs> and so, well, yeah, we help helping people realize that, you know. Well, um, that's so important to that you mentioned that because some people listening will say, well, these people didn't really have a back problem. You know, they, they thought they had a back problem, but they didn't really have it. But these people had real problems. I mean, this they had documented spinal problems, abnormalities. So they were having real pain. It wasn't like, quote unquote, it's all in your head, right? Uh, that, that was not the situation here. That's right. They've been to, you know, many doctors in the past, been on various treatments, um, you know, yeah, and it re really affects on their life. And many, the average, on average, it was 10 years in, in chronic pain. Um, some of them, it was much longer, you know, for their whole lives or most of their lives, they'd been in pain. Uh, and this was the first time that they were, they were, you know, substantially improved. Now, I'm gonna ask you a quick, a tough question. I mean, do you think that this approach to chronic pain can potentially replace pain medicine like opioids in the future? Um, I, well, I, I, I think of this as, as a toolbox. I actually personally think that, that very few people should be on, on opioids um, just, just because there's actually evidence from neuroscience now that's emerged that they actually can make pain worse. So opioids can cause increases in spinal inflammation and neuroinflammation, can sensitize nociceptive neurons, um, and can desensitize, you know, places in your brain that may help you feel good, <laughs> right? And, and, and produce motivation to, 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 to work, to play, to, to connect. Um, so, so I think that opioids are truly harmful um, for many people. Um, and it's, it's really tough. My, some of my family members have been on opioids for 20 years. You know, so that's, and it's, right. it's really tough once you're, once you're there. Um, but so, so, you know, so, so, but do I think that, that these things are going to replace them entirely? No, I don't, I don't think that they're going to replace them entirely, but the truth is that there is basically no known highly effective pharmacological treatment for chronic pain of most types. Um, and so simple opioids, they simply just don't work long-term. The, the dose right. ends up escalating and the, and the benefit you know, gets smaller and smaller. Um, right. You know, for chronic back pain, NSAIDs in, in meta analyses, they just they just don't really work. <laughs> you know, they don't right. they don't produce pain relief. Um, various other things that people have tried, gabapentin and so on, they don't they don't work well on average. Um, that doesn't mean that they can never work for some people. So I think that the brain is immensely complicated. And so if people try something, they try an SSRI, they try gabapentin, and it works for them. I think that's also possible. You know, mm -hmm. so, so I don't think that we just, you know, throw out all the drugs and, and, and that's it, right? right. But, but I, think that, um, I think that these kinds of approaches should really be the 
first line of, of defense. You know, and, and even some, some people have even started studying these kinds of principles pre-surgery, you know, because if you go into surgery, right, you haven't had anything happen to you yet, you know, let's say you're having a, a thoracotomy or, in, you know, or something like that, right? You, um, high transition to chronic pain rate, like really bad back surgery also, very high, you know, uh, chronic pain after back surgery, um, some of it caused by the back surgery. So even before that, you know, what we know that if you come in depressed, anxious, afraid of the surgery, uh, and with a lot of negative sym somatic symptoms, you stand a, a decent chance that the surgery is going to make you worse rather than better. Yeah, that, that's that's so true. So I mean, at the very least, it seems to be a, uh, a could be a big part of the toolkit uh, for treating pain. And I guess the the best the one of the best parts there's really no downside there. There's no risk to getting this treatment as opposed to any other type of treatment for for chronic pain. I'm assuming. I, yeah, I think I think that's I think that's partially right. That's mostly right. <laughs> you know, okay. uh, um, you do can, tell, uh, do tell. Yeah, improve yeah, Im improve the mindset, but even beforehand, right? So okay, so why is it why is it I think it's sort of only mostly right? It's it's because you know all of these um, all of these treatments come at an opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. So there there is you know I think. Um, we, I think it's good to live in this gray zone where there is a lot of complexity and we realize that be very humble. We can't, you know, we don't know often what exactly are the things that are driving any person's pain. So, um, and th there are stories where there are medical interventions and medical things that have been discovered with, you know, peripheral nerves and you can fix those yeah. things, right? Yeah. So, so I, you know, I, I, I think that's important to recognize that that complexity as well. So I think that there's little cost um, in doing doing this or learning these principles and practicing them to reduce this uh, this cycle of of fear and pain sensitization and that that sensitization component. I don't think that always means that you should never look for you know peripheral causes of pain. Right. It doesn't mean that all, all pain is like in your in, in your brain, <laughs> you know, it's good brain jet. So, so yeah. that, that's, the, that's the caveat, right? That's an important one. I mean, obviously, you don't want to be uh, putting red flags aside saying I can overcome this with with this treatment where you might be ignoring, a, you know, a, a serious problem that can't that needs to be treated. Now, with regards to this treatment, you had mentioned two practitioners that kind of brought it to your attention. Is this treatment something that's mainstream? Is it something that people can access across the country or across the world, or it's very still experimental and, and novel? So I, I think this is becoming more mainstream. And I should say that this, this version of treatment, PRT, is involves a lot of principles that have been practiced by many other people and discovered and rediscovered sometimes mm -hmm. by pain psychologists practicing cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, um, sometimes by people who have been practicing uh, pain exposure. So it turns out pain exposure is, it can be a treatment for, for pain because mm -hmm. if pain is not dangerous, you can do the thing that hurts. And so some forms of therapy actually encourage people to do that thing that hurts. And that's part of PRT as well. Um, so there are principles that have been discovered and rediscovered. You know, physical therapists uh, work with you know, inducing inducing painful movements and 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 things like that in a controlled way, and that can really help to to make this connection and desensitize. Um, PRT is a is a particular combination of those things, um, and and um, so I would say that there there are a, a variety of practitioners, but but not all forms of CBT, for example, are are equal in this way. So so often with a sort of standard versions of CBT, there's no acknowledgement that uh, that neural sensitization is driving the pain. There's no sense of, of increased safety. They're, they don't tell you the pain is not dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, right. they just say, we're going to cope with it. Right. So, so that's, that's different. So it depends on who you're going to, right? Um, I will say that with what um, Alan Gordon and Howard Schubin are doing, they both do see patients. Uh, Alan is the pain psychology center. Mm -hmm. um, dot com, I think it is. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and Howard has a practice. Uh, there's a group of other people in various places that have uh, practices that are grounded in similar um, principles. You know, yeah. uh, so, so like David Hanscom has an outreach to, to many people. He's a former surgeon who sort of, you know, made some connections with some of these principles and is, um, is working on that. Um, 
lo lots of different people. So I don't want to say, you know, name too many names, but, you know, Fran Summer Anderson in, in, in New York City and, um, uh, yeah, just a variety of different practices, right? Um, is, there a, is there some type of online resource that, that people can go to to find people or, or to get more information that you know of from, from that's specific to this pain reprocessing therapy? Um, I have a, a list that I've, you know, sent to people. I think um, um, Howard Schubiner has a website that is really mm -hmm. useful and he made some videos, which I think are really accessible. Uh, oh, cool. And they're, they explain things in a really clear way. They're little drawings. They're, they're great, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Another really interesting one is um, David Butler and Lorimer Mosley in Australia. So, so uh, like Lorimer Mosley is a physiotherapist who um, focus on pain, pain neuroscience education. So explaining to people some of the same principles. So they have some wonderful sort of videos and stuff that are out there public, you know, publicly as well. Awesome. And I think that covers some of the same principles. Yeah, maybe if it's okay with you, maybe you can provide them to us and we'll put them on the site so that people, if they're watching there, so they can click through and take a look. And, you know, we always like to give them resources to, trusted resources to be able to check out. Um, yeah, I can send you a few links for sure. That, that'll be awesome. That'll be awesome. Um, do you see this evolving beyond pain? Do you see this evolving to other medical conditions that, or is it, do you think this is purely a pain phenomenon? Oh, I, I think I think this is beyond pain itself. And actually that question reminds me of other people too. Like no. so, so David Clark has a whole association, the Psychophysiologic Disorders Association. He he is an MD also who's been treating people not only with chronic pain, but other kinds of, you know, there's there's nausea, itch. Um, there's a lot of medically unexplained symptoms that can can manifest in in different ways. Got it. Um, so it, it can apply to a lot of different sensations, basically. I think, I think it, I think it can. That's right. And I think, I think it really does. I, I think, and I think all of these, all of these symptoms, right? These sensations in the body, um, uh, and even things that cause real actions like nausea and vomiting, right? That's, you know, there, there are, there are these same kinds of processes of neural sensitization and association with other settings and places and, and contexts that can, um, that can really be important for some people. That's fantastic. Dr. Weger, I think you've given a lot of hope to a lot of people out there that are that are feel like they've kind of reached a, a dead end in terms of managing pain. And like you said, it's not a panacea, it's not a cure-all, it, it doesn't apply to everyone, but it can offer a lot of hope to potentially a lot of people. So uh, with that, I, I thank you. I'm going to ask you a question completely unrelated to, to pain management or, or uh, to this type of therapy. But, uh, you know, the title of this uh, podcast is Better Man Clinics. And, you know, the idea is getting better in every way possible, living your best life. You've obviously been able to reach a significant level of success in your life. What's your secret to your success? What's the, the secret to living your best life? Oh, wow. That's a good surprise question. I, yeah, I didn't put that, that one on the list. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I, okay. I'm going to give you one quote. It's from a book called The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. Mm -hmm. And, and what it says is, you know, work with love. And if you don't love it, you know, don't, don't do it, but find, you know, find the love. And, and so for me in my work life, um, I've really tried to anchor on that, you know, to, to, to enjoy that process, to do it out of, I don't know, curiosity, um, and to, to, you know, pursue it for the love of, of doing it. And I think it keeps me motivated and, and it keeps it fun. So that's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> Well, I think that's a great thing. I think, listen, following your passion and doing something you love is is, is a, a key to happiness and success. I think it's been proven for sure. So fantastic advice. Dr. Wager, thank you so much again for your time and for your insights. It's been a fascinating conversation. And to all of you guys out there watching and listening, thank you for joining. And remember our mantra here at Better Man Clinics, your best life is a journey and not a destination and use every single day to just get a little bit better. Take care and we'll see you next time. All right, thank you.